So you set them up from the setup table and manage. And so kind of our examples of company type, prospect, active co customer, vendor, these are all things that managers work with. But then the VIP and the different time zone, these are ones that would benefit from a service alert. And so you go into the company type and then there's the checkup box here for, an act, for activating the service alert. And then you can put in that text box below that whatever information that you want the text to have at their fingertips when they're looking at this ticket for this client or this customer. Great way to just have that information ahead there for them. You don't have to memorize a list. I'm sure you said um, set up tables and then what was the next one? So it's under the set of tables when you go into the company type or the client uh, the contact type. It's just so you can see here we set up have the company type there. It's just a little further down on that screen. You just do the checkbox for enable a service alert, and then the text box there is whatever you want it to say. Now, like I said, you can only have service alerts on five company types and five client types, but you can apply multiple company and contact types per record. That makes sense, right? Everybody? <laughs> it seems complicated, so I want to make sure that I'm clarifying that there. So then same thing with the contact. So that VIP client. So if it's somebody that, you know, maybe you want to put a note in there about a VIP client and say, hey, reach out to the, kid, the manager if there's the account manager if somebody here calls it. When they prefer calls. <laughs> you know, you, yeah. you don't want that client calling because you sent an email saying their ticket's done and they're like, well, I never heard from you. And they wanted to get a phone call instead of an email. So this is a great way to say, nope, call this person before you email them. Let them know what's going on. They want that hands on so touch. Set this up for a company. Will that show up under every single ticket? Yep, every single ticket for that so company. Regardless of the board, right? Yep, it is board agnostic, but it was every time for every time for the company, or in this case, every time for the client. And again, you just when setting up the contact type, do the name and then service alerts. I can't stress enough making sure that anywhere in ConnectWise, when you name things, <laughs> make sure it's intuitive. Because you know the next person that comes in trying to figure out some of that stuff helps if it makes sense to, to them to use it. So and then here, you can see that we have the notes set up. Oh no, this is <laughs> so then not. So we have the company type, and now we have the company status. So the company type is where it's at in the sales process, whether they're an active customer and VIP, whatever. The company status, they can only have one, and that's their financial standing. So we can do notifications and alerts with this, and with this, ooh. so credit pull. So this is great for those customers that, you know, you're not, they haven't been keeping up on their bills and you don't want the text to service them. Have the notify checkbox here and whatever message you put down there will come up for the text. So they are behind on payments, contact their account manager or finance or whatever when they call. And then this disallow saving checkbox is great. So then you can't save a ticket. It, keeps, it stops them from having any work done if they're in credit hold, but you have to set it up. Um, this is also great for former customers, and you can customize that notification message per those types, but you can only have one company status, because that's the financial standing. So not approved, onboarding, credit hold, former client, those might be all statuses that you don't want to allow them to save, and then you have a pop-up giving them more information of how to go about the, what they should do for next steps. And this is a pop-up right in their face. Let's see what happens. Oh, I do have an example that's coming up. So, ooh, wrong direction, I apologize. So as I said, they can only have one status, multiple types. Are we all good on that? Okay. <laughs> company, we get the company type. I know the company type and company status can get kind of confusing. So one's a financial standing, one's a sales standing. So let's look at the 
two different options here. So this is the company stats, financial standing, and you can see here from the typical company screen, that can't be changed. So if you don't have access to the company finance information, you're not gonna be able to change the status. But then the company type, we can stack them and have multiple on there. So VIP, vendor, different time zone. And if they fall off that first 30 days, it's a quick, easy check box or the X and it goes away. So this is the pop-up, you can't see it from over here. This is our pop-up for the uh, credit poll. So you can see we have the place for the notes and then the additional information. I wonder, the if, you, I wonder if you can turn the lights off. That I have no clue how to do. Kind of. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> Anybody know? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. So the problem with these is the tech can click this little button, do not show this message again. <laughs> so you have to be careful when oh. you use these because they are in your face and there's something that you have to close. So it keeps the tech from using it, but they have the option to make it disappear forever. Can this be color coded? No. Unfortunately not. And the the oops, the alerts is always just an orange bar. It can be minimized as you see, it has a little arrow. It can be minimized, you bring it down, it shows the information. So the disadvantage of that is there's no way of forcing the text to read this information. <laughs> you know, you, you put out there that they prefer phone calls or you put this information, so it's a matter, you have to train the text to look for the information, to know that it's there. It can save them time and hassle. You know, if you have the client who prefers phone calls and they get an email and then they call the tech and they're angry, that's going to encourage the tech to definitely Oh, Thanks. Thank Maybe. you. You're awesome. It's been a second ago. I'm pretty sure I turned the lights off on the swipe room. Probably just next door, Brian. He's good. So, do you, uh, how are you guys currently documenting standard operating procedures? I know I just talked to some people at lunch who use IT Glue. Anybody else have something else? IT glue is pretty much the But it, what it, what is that in, in that third party thing or Yeah, yeah, yeah IT glue it's um, a documentation platform. Oh, yep. It also has other things that can, it integrates with manage. <laughs> oh, it does. <laughs> yeah. So, IT small glue. sales pitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> management asks for these things sometimes. So, in IT Boost, so Connectwise now has their own documentation knowledge base. IT Boost. Very similar to IT Glue. And something in IT Boost that we're doing is standard operating procedures. So we used to have the runbook, they're kind of moving from calling it the runbook to standard operating procedures. So you can have general SOPs or they can be specific to a client company. And then you can create templates for your company, and we also have some that we can you can implement or import. So at IT Nation Share, they put out their, I think, 10 uh, SOPs for, or not for Share, for Secure. So security, so we're building out that. Their plan is to have around 50 by the end of the year that you can import. Um, I do believe there is a trial, and I think that is the QR code, although it looks a little wonky on here, so let me know if it doesn't work for you and I can get you that information. There's definitely some skewing issues going on here. <laughs> so, but the templates can then be built out with time estimates, just like a, pro very similar to a project plan. Does the QR code work, TVB? Oh yeah, that's... Yes. Excellent. Because um, I have quite a few of them in there, so it's good to know. So you could, just like with a project plan, you could put in your time estimates, and you can look, link to, you can, build your template so that it links to a configuration. So when you apply it to a specific company, it will pull, you can go in and tell it to pull that configuration. So when your techs are looking at this SOP, they have all the information and they can click right on the configuration that they need to update or need to know the information. Definitely lots of updates in progress coming up for this, but there is a 14 day trial going on. Okay. 
End of sales pitch. I'm done on IT Boost. I promise. Uh, so how do you keep your managers informed? I know we have a few service managers in here. Oh, yeah. So are you watching the board all the time? <laughs> yeah, I was about to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> So it's been said that the only thing worse than a meeting that could have been an email is that email that could have been a dashboard. So that information, if you're having to scroll through an email to get all the information you need, why don't, why don't you have it on a dashboard and make it easier to see? So managers need to manage by exception and only address the things that are out of the norm. So they need alerts when something is falling out of expectations. So, reports, ticket follow feature, and custom workflow rules. So, emails, alerts, all of that, it's very distracting. <laughs> when you're also then, I'm guessing probably have people coming into your office asking questions, and you miss the notification, and then you come back to your desk and you have like 20 emails, right? So, a dashboard gives you a bird's eye view of seeing what's going on at any one time. So that helps reduce the noise and gives you the information that you need at your hands when you need it. So this is our QR code to the report frequency matrix. So this gives you an idea. So if you go to the service manager, it shows up, it tells you what reports we're recommending you run and how often you should run them and gives you some of the dashboards that are built into manage. So this is the service dashboard current. So it shows you the tickets open, what's not responded to, and lets you know at a high level where you are with your tickets and your responses. That's the built-in service this dashboard? Is, this is a built-in service dashboard. It's under reports in ConnectWise Manage. Oh, okay. It's the dashboard service current. Um, this is not unlike the desktop and bright gauge, though this is not dynamic. You have to pull this up every time you want the information. So it, it will not change once you pull it up? No. Okay. If you want the dynamic dashboard, you gotta do the bright gauge. So you can see here, we can see our SLA goals, quick, what's responded to, what we missed, what we hit. These are the things that the manager, these are the things that you need to know at your fingertips. And as I was mentioning this morning, QR code for the information to do bright gauge essentials. So this is a screenshot of the operations dashboard. So you can see a little more information and even in the bright gauge essentials, you can't customize the dashboard, but you can still drill down to all of that information. So, and this only refreshes every 24 hours. So with essentials, it is not a dynamic. It is only every 24 hours. But it gives you an idea of what Bright Gauge can do. And if you like it, then you need oh, to Oh, the essentials like a free trial? The essentials is actually, it's not a trial. It is just three dashboards, but there's, they're Limited. only update every 24 hours and you can't customize them. Okay. If you discover you like this and like being to have this information at your fingertips, you can do the full version of Bright, Bright Gauge that gives you a lot more customization and personalization. Okay. So here, who here uses follow tickets? Excellent. <laughs> nice to know. So following the ticket is a resource light. You don't necessarily get all of those email updates and pings but you know what's going on and you can find it from your, so it's on your today screen under the tab of following. So you can see those tickets at a quick glance, but you're not gonna get bombarded with all the emails that might be going back and forth. Um, it's great for when you're onboarding and your tech and you just wanna be able to make sure, watch what they're doing without having to get all the noise of that. You can follow their tickets and you can do workflow rules that automatically set up to follow a ticket for certain texts or certain clients. We'll look at that a little later too. So to follow a ticket, there's just the little button up at the top. You can click it and then it's automatically added to your 
following list. Oh, that's the screen I was looking for. <laughs> I knew it was here somewhere. Um, so on your today's screen, on your ticket list, you have a tab for the things that you're following. So a quick, easy way to see what the status is on those. Workflow rules. I know I've talked to some of you who are starting to implement workflow rules. They are fabulous. They are a great way to keep track of those things that are falling out of falling out of expectations and that are missing their goals without having to stay in the board all the time. So are the SLA goals being met? Processes, statuses, tickets closed in a timely manner. So you can have all kinds of different things set up, actions and triggers based on your thresholds and what you're looking for. And customer service issues. So being able to track that you can do workflow rules based on smileback service. So if you're using that, you can kind of look for those issues where maybe the customer service isn't meeting expectations. And as I said before, you can set workflow rules to automatically add you as a follower. So if there is a company that you're having issues with, if there's a new tech that you're wanting to watch, you can set up a workflow rule that will automatically add you as a follower. Look at some of the other things. So you can also have set up workflow rules to notify. So if you do want an email on a certain situation, so you're following the ticket, but if it goes past this, <laughs> I want to be notified either with a no. email or maybe a push alert. And you can do all of that through workflow rules. If you add yourself to a ticket as a follower, does mm -hmm. it automatically remove you when it's closed? Yes. Yeah, once the ticket's closed, it's not gonna show up in your following because the ticket's closed. It doesn't necessarily remove you as a follower. So if the ticket got reopened because a client emails in and it reopens, you'll still be following it. Okay, so that's all the internal communication. Now, how are we communicating with our clients? You wanna make sure that you're communicating the right information, setting those expectations and letting them know whatever information they need to know about the ticket and how it's being worked. They probably are getting just as many junk emails as you are every day. So you wanna make sure that you're getting that, making sure that you're getting their attention so that it's not getting missed and they think that you're not working their ticket. Alternatively, there's also those times that maybe you have a status notification set up so when it changes statuses, it sends a notification, but you also are using closed loop or maybe you're sending a work, maybe you have a workflow rule that's also sending an email. So then the client ends up with five emails for the same ticket for the same information. So it can be a little noise, noisy and cluttering for them. So clients need to know that we've received their request. So if they're emailing in, we don't want them just sending that email in and not knowing if it's been received, thinking it's gone into the great beyond and they, especially if they don't get a call right away. So having that status that says, yes, we've received, your, we've received your request and we're working on it and setting that expectation of when they can expect somebody getting back to them and information. And then you wanna make sure that you reach out to the client when there's an update. And of course, then when the ticket has been closed. Just because you think it's closed, maybe the client doesn't think it's necessarily solved. So having that opportunity to say, okay, we've closed this, if it's still an issue, please let us know, and then having those workflow rules that are automatically reopen that ticket and bring it to the alert of the tech. I have a question though. Do, do most people let their clients see every update to the ticket? Because we've only selected them to see when the ticket's created and then, um, and then basically when it's completed. But a lot of the status changes between that, we don't allow them to see the, all those things because we just feel like it creates them to keep, well, what's going on? Well, why couldn't you resolve it? And I'm just curious, does everybody let the client see every status update? No. Okay. Yeah. I can, I can probably tell you the way we do it. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, when you walk in on a ticket, you have a choice to either make the notes internal or external, right? External, usually you'll use for communication with them. Everything else is external. Yeah. Internal communication. Obviously, you don't want them to see that. Yeah. Well, and it's, you don't necessarily want a status notification turned on for all of those things. Like if you're waiting for the vendor or something, you don't want a status notification going out to the client for that. Yeah. But yeah. if you're using closed loop and the 
um, tech is putting in notes of what was done or documenting a conversation what they have they have with the client. It's great to make sure you have closed loop on and still send that email out to the client, recapping that phone call. So what is closed loop? Is that a feature in ConnectWise or is that? It's in discussion, you check mark the customer. Yeah, it's a complicated email. way and actually, it's a complicated way to talk about making sure that you enter time and email the client all at the same time. Okay. So that's the close loop on the conversation. So you're making sure that the techs are doing their time entry, but also documenting those notes and those notes then go as an email out to the customer. So that's a feature you can turn on? Yep. And then if they if they like if they go to close the ticket and the time's not inputted, that's what that does, basically. It tells them they need to finish Well, no, it doesn't force them. There are definitely checkboxes that you can force time entry, but closed loop is not that oh, okay. option. But okay. it does so when they go to put in their notes for the external discussion or in internal, internal discussion, whoever you have it set up with, it will automatically bring up that um, time entry option. Oh, okay. So using notif status and notifications, workflow rules, the customer portal, and the communications manager to make sure that you're updating the customers or the clients with the information they need. So they get a lot of emails from Manage <laughs> with the auto reply, status notifications, resource update when you're using closed workflow. Maybe you have a workflow rule telling them, oh, your ticket's been sitting for three days. We're going to close it if you don't email back. These are all things, all ways that we're communicating with the client and it can be overwhelming. So making sure that you are aware of where all the customer emails are coming, where all those things that you're sending out to the customer are coming from. So this is the recommended status notification. So what you were just talking about, wanting to know at what point. So this is kind of what we recommend. Letting them know when it's new. Hey, we've received your ticket. This is the expectation. You know, whatever your SLA goal is, you know, maybe you expect to hear from us within the hour, two hours. Um, it's still an issue and you can have workflow rules that automatically move it into this. But we haven't heard from you in three days. Are you still there? <laughs> is it still an issue? Did you, what's going on? And then letting them know, close no response. We've closed the ticket, we never heard from you. And closed, obviously, you want them to know that the resources confirmed the issue is resolved. You wanna give them the opportunity to say, well, maybe not, it's still an issue. And then that would be the reopen, you've successfully reopened. So I mentioned workflow rules. So after three days, you can have it go to flip to the still issue and then the status automatically sends an email to the customer. The tech never has to do it. The tech doesn't have to sit there and bug the client. You just have a workflow rule that automatically does it for you. And then after you've sent out that status for still issue, if the client hasn't responded, you close it no response. And then again, that sends out a notification. The tech never has to touch it. So these are automations that can keep your techs from having to bother those ticket and the tickets that are covering up your your service boards. Yeah, we currently use that. Yeah. yeah. They're a great option, especially because you don't want to be, you don't want your tech spending all their time trying to track down these issues, knowing are they still an issue? Is it not an issue? Looks like we're having a field trip around the pool. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on over there. Yeah, you won't believe like the amount of that actually closed because no response because yep. it auto corrects or they don't want to admit that it was, you know, something they were doing wrong. So. Yep. Yeah. It's it, automatically and it's that whole, you then play phone tag and you spend so much energy and effort and the texts get frustrated. So just automate it with the status notification and just workflow rules, moves it through the process. Your texts are happier. The client doesn't have to interact with you. You know, that whole eliminating the interacting with people <laughs> that we talked about this morning. However, that works. So then also, let me see here. I don't remember what this QR code goes to. I know it's a university documentation. I don't remember which one. So this is for the statuses service board setup table. So just kind of our recommendations, best practices, setting up those statuses and maybe those status notifications. If you are interested in that. So next, email tokens. 
So when we're sending out emails to our clients, we want to make sure that they're looking as personalized as possible so that they don't think it's an automated message. They want to know that we're taking that personal time to reach out to them. So of course we always put the um, ticket number in there so that we make sure it comes back to the ticket and we're not creating more tickets for ourselves. But using that subject line to let them know if it's just strictly informational or a call to action, this is great both internally and for the client. So this gives them a, do I have to, do I have to open this right away? So if you need, or if you're waiting for a response for them, maybe you put in the subject line, response needed so that they know, okay, I need to look at this to move it forward and it doesn't get lost in their inbox. And another great thing is making sure that you include a brief recap so that if they have multiple tickets open, you wanna make sure that they know which ticket you're communicating on. So giving that, the details in any entry notes that you have on that, and you can put those in there. And of course, we always recommend linking to the customer portal. It's a great opportunity to let the client self-service so they can see from the customer portal, they can see the updates on the ticket, they can see the status, they can communicate with the text and update that information right from the customer portal for you. Do you recommend putting that in a response that they get from the status? Yes. Like on the initial ticket creation? Absolutely, because then, so that gives them, they can then immediately see what the status is and if they have any additional information. So maybe they send in the ticket, as uh, <laughs> Eric was talking about, they send in the ticket and then they realize it was user error. And they don't necessarily want to call and have that conversation that, oh yeah, I, I, I missed, I typed the wrong thing or it was my fault. They can go into the customer portal from that link and send that information and let the tech know, nope, this is no longer an issue, go ahead and close out the ticket. So it eliminates that interaction. They don't have to pick up the phone and call, they can quickly go into the customer portal, update their own ticket. Can you format the subject line, right? So you have a plan for the closed loop, even if it's outside of closed loop, you move it on. Okay. So if you get a notification via a workflow or you send something out, as long as you do the format of the ticket number and pound, and then a forward. I think it's, slash, it's pound, ticket number, and then yeah, forward slash. Forward yeah. slash, as long as you put that somewhere in the subject line. It doesn't need to be in, just somewhere anywhere in the line. The email can anywhere pick it up. So to yep. your point, with your example, I could do the oops, I'm sorry, even if it came through a workflow and then it said, I've been, we're waiting for an answer back from you or whatever. Yep. If I reply to that, it'll hit the forward, the board's smart enough to match that ticket, and then your tech can read or dispatch the read. So let's check it out. Yeah, and so to hit the point that you were making, that you want the ticket number in there, but it doesn't have to be at the beginning. So if you want to have that call to action or just an update on your ticket, whatever that, so that they know where in the process it is. You can put that before the ticket number, you just need the ticket number and there's somewhere for Manage to see, but it's not necessarily pertinent to the customer themselves, because then, I don't know any customer that ever calls in knowing their ticket number. <laughs> I don't think that ever happens. <laughs> so, and we've been talking a lot about the portal. So you can see here the portal, from the portal you can create a ticket, they can look for an tic existing ticket, they can look at their projects and they can pay and look at invoices. <laughs> so if you have problems with customers sending in, losing their invoices in their inbox or not necessarily paying on time, the customer portal is a great opportunity for them because you can also set up through some payment options and they're not having to send that check in the mail, it just automatically comes through. So a great way to give them back some control and kind of push it back on them. And then you can see here, this is, so when they go into the customer portal and looking, and depending on their permissions in the customer portal for their company, they can either see only the tickets they submitted, or if it's maybe a VP or something that you wanna be able to have access to all of the tickets for the company, and that's set at the permissions level. So you can let them know, you can see what they want, and then they can click into these and get more information about where it is in the process and any notes. So if they've lost that email and they're like, oh, I have to respond to that, this is a great, great, great way for them to just be able to go out, get that information to you without playing email tag or phone tag.
If you're interested in more information about the customer portal, we do have a customer portal kit. There's a couple of videos out there and some how to's on how to get it set up and all of that fun information. So then lastly, I wanna talk about communications manager. So generally we think about all of the information that we've talked about before is all reactive communication with the customer. You're, they're sending in a ticket, they're needing help, but how do you communicate with them proactively? So if Microsoft is having an outage or Office 365, you can use communications manager as a way to get that information out to those customers proactively. So you don't end up with the slew of tickets into your board, or maybe you have five tickets and you wanna communicate with all of those people at once saying, okay, we know Microsoft is having an outage. I like to pick on Microsoft because they're always there. Um, so we know they're having an outage and you can proactively send that information to them, which helps get rid of, eliminate some of that noise of coming into your board can set the expectations we know about this we're working on it and you can still do those email tokens to customize that so it looks like you're talking to them personally but it's a mass email so you can send things so from communications manager you can compose an email and you can send things to communications manager from configuration so if you know there's been a breach for a certain manufacturer or a certain configuration or if you know that there's an update needed or you're looking at their configurations and you see that it's coming up to end of life you can select those things send them to communications manager select them and make the email does this go out to the uh, primary contact of each company or how, how do you so define? it depends on if it's a ticket it would go to, it depends on who you select. So if, <laughs> when you send this stuff there, it brings up, so if it's the ticket, it would bring in the contact. If it's, you know, company based maybe for the um, configurations going out of date, it would be the primary, but you still have the option. If it has multiple contacts for the company, you have the option to select which ones you want to send it to. What if it's something you want to send to every single customer or client that you have? You can absolutely do that. Yep, you can do that through communications manager. So usually communications manager has often been used for marketing, but it still is a great way to proactively communicate with your customers about issues. We, I can show you how we do it. We, we, we would go through, every time we add a company into our contacts, you can send it directly to the principals. So if you wanted to send something like this just to the principals of the company, you can do that through communication. Yep. Yeah. And you can. Yeah. Yep. You can build groups, so you can select things. So if you're in configurations, you can select certain configurations, sort it, select all those configurations, and tell it to send it to communications manager. And before you start composing that email, you can create it as a group. So say these are all our Office 365 customers. So you now have this group saved for future. And anytime there's an Office 365 issue, you can proactively communicate with them, or if you have like Fortinet or other product, other hardware products that you want to let them know about. Likely you can, same way you can also do that from the service board. So if you have a slew of tickets coming in about an issue, you can select all those tickets, send them to communications manager and create an email from there. With the service boards, you might not necessarily want to save it as a group for later. Um, it might just be a one-time instance. I wish I would have known this earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, a great tool for mass communication on that proactive. So it's trying to get that information ahead of, in, in, out to them before they're bombarding you with information or with questions. So as I was saying, you can sort by opportunities for those of you who are here in sales agreements. So if you have, um, if you're changing the pricing on your whatever gold level agreement, you can mass update and tell everybody that. Okay. Or if you have a specific agreement type that maybe you, all of your customers who have Office 365 have this one type of agreement type and Office 365 is raising the price, so you're gonna raise the price of your contract, you can send that out to them and you can find most customers based on that. Um, and like we talked about with the service board and the configurations. 
So you can see here, have the drop down that you can add them to a group before you compose the email if that's what you want to, if it's something that makes sense that you're going to need to communicate to these people in the future. Something to keep in mind if you add, as you add new customers, you will need to update the groups. It doesn't auto add those people to it. So if you have a new configuration, it's not going to automatically add them to the group. It doesn't know that you want them in there. So just something to keep in mind as you're creating these groups and adding new customers, make sure you're updating as well. So key takeaways for today, identify what information is critical to which stakeholders. So what information does the tech need, what information does the manager need, and what information does your client need? And then implement the notification tool that best suits the update, whether it's something that they need to take action on right away or it's something that's purely informational. How do you communicate that and what's the best way? So status notifications, the company type and contact type notifications, workflow rule, push notifications, whatever that is. And then tailor that delivery to the audience. Give them the information they need, a call to action in the email, telling them if it's still been sitting in a status that it shouldn't be for too long, what are the next steps? How do they, what do they need to do to fix this? So that they know and can take those steps to rectify it and not have to come ask you for questions. And then just if you don't know, out on the university, we've been working very hard to put together our Pass to Product Proficiency. This is the link to our service delivery. This is great. It breaks down the different roles within the service delivery, the service manager, the tech, the automate, and it gives you kind of the information that you need for that role. So what does that, what, what tools and what information do you know, need to be successful in that role? We also have them out there for um, marketing and finance. Well, finance is still coming, it's finished, it's just, they're, they're still coding it. Um, but great opportunities. And so yeah, service manager, dispatcher, automate admin, and service team. So it takes you through the life cycle and what kind of information do you need to be successful in that role. And that's it. Any questions that I haven't already answered as we've been going along? Anything? Were you saying that they're updating the university training? or what? Um, up, We are always updating the yeah, university okay. training. Yeah. Um, we're always, but so the path to product proficiency, ooh, wrong direction. Um, this packed product proficiency, the service delivery is out there, the marketing and sales is out there, and we've recently finished doing the finance piece. I just don't know that it's been put out to the university yet, but it is definitely coming. And yeah, every time we do a webinar, it's out on the university. We're constantly updating our how-to videos. I know DBV and the team have been working on getting stuff out there for RMM. So the university is a great first, first resource for information.